Part 2, Chapter 9 of My Lady's Money. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. My Lady's Money by Wilkie Collins. Part 2, Chapter 9. The next day, Mr. Troy, taking Robert Moody with him as a valuable witness, rang the bell at the mean and dirty lodging house in which old Sharon received the clients who stood in need of his advice. They were led upstairs to a back room on the second floor of the house. Entering the room, they discovered, through a thick cloud of tobacco smoke, a small, fat, bald-headed, dirty old man in an armchair, robed in a tattered flannel dressing gown, with a short pipe in his mouth, a pug dog on his lap, and a French novel in his hands. "'Is it business?' asked old Sharon, speaking in a hoarse, asthmatical voice, and fixing a pair of bright, shameless black eyes attentively on the two visitors. "'It is business,' Mr. Troy answered looking at the old rogue who had disgraced an honorable profession, as he might have looked at a reptile which had just risen rampant at his feet. "'What is your fee for a consultation?' "'You give me a guinea, and I'll give you half an hour.' With this reply, old Sharon held out his unwashed hand across the rickety, ink-splashed table at which he was sitting." Mr. Troy would not have touched him with the tips of his own fingers for a thousand pounds. He laid the guinea on the table. Old Sharon burst into a fierce laugh, a laugh strangely accompanied by a frowning contraction of his eyebrows and a frightful exhibition of the whole inside of his mouth. "'I'm not clean enough for you, eh?' he said, with an appearance of being very much amused. There's a dirty old man described in this book that is a little like me. He held up his French novel. Have you read it? A capital story, well put together. Ah, you haven't read it. You have a pleasure to come. I say, do you mind tobacco smoke? I think faster when I smoke, that's all. Mr. Troy's respectable hand waved a silent permission to smoke given under dignified protest. All right, said old Sharon. Now get on. He laid himself back in his chair and puffed out his smoke, with eyes lazily half-closed, like the eyes of the pug dog on his lap. At that moment, indeed, there was a curious resemblance between the two. They both seemed to be preparing themselves in the same idle way for the same comfortable nap. Mr. Troy stated the circumstances under which the 500-pound note had disappeared in clear and consecutive narrative. When he had done, old Sharon suddenly opened his eyes. The pug dog suddenly opened his eyes. Old Sharon looked hard at Mr. Troy. The pug looked hard at Mr. Troy. Old Sharon spoke. The pug growled. I know who you are. You're a lawyer. Don't be alarmed. I never saw you before, and I don't know your name. What I do know is a lawyer's statement of facts when I hear it. Who's this? Old Sharon looked inquisitively at Moody as he put the question. Mr. Troy introduced Moody as a competent witness, thoroughly acquainted with the circumstances, and ready and willing to answer any questions relating to them. Old Sharon waited a little, smoking hard and thinking hard. Now then, he burst out in his fiercely sudden way, I'm going to get to the root of the matter. He leaned forward with his elbows on the table and began his examination of Moody. Heartily, as Mr. Troy despised and disliked the old rogue, he listened with astonishment and admiration literally extorted from him by the marvelous ability with which the questions were adapted to the end in view. In a quarter of an hour, old Sharon had extracted from the witness everything, literally everything, down to the smallest detail that Moody could tell him, 
having now in his own phrase got to the root of the matter he relighted his pipe with a grunt of satisfaction and laid himself back in his old armchair well said mr troy have you formed your opinion yes i form my opinion what is it instead of replying old sharon winked confidentially at mr troy and put a question on his side i say is a ten-pound note much of an object to you it depends on what the money is wanted for answered mr troy look here said old sharon i give you an opinion for your guinea but mind this it's an opinion founded on hearsay and you know as a lawyer what that is worth venture your ten pounds in plain english pay me for my time and trouble in a baffling and difficult case and i'll give you an opinion founded on my own experience explain yourself a little more clearly said mr troy what do you guarantee to tell us if we venture the ten pounds i guarantee to name the person or the persons on whom the suspicion really rests and if you employ me after that i guarantee before you pay me a halfpenny more to prove that i am right by laying my hand on the thief let us have the guinea opinion first said mr troy old sharon made another frightful exhibition of the whole inside of his mouth his laugh was louder and fiercer than ever i like you he said to mr troy you are so devilish fond of your money lord how rich you must be now listen here's the guinea opinion suspect in this case the very last person on whom suspicion could possibly fall moody listening attentively started and changed color at those last words mr troy looked thoroughly disappointed and made no attempt to conceal it is that all he asked all retorted the cynical vagabond you're a pretty lawyer what more can i say when i don't know for certain whether the witness who has given me my information has misled me or not have i spoken to the girl and formed my own opinion no have i been introduced among the servants as errand boy or to clean the boots and shoes or what not and have i formed my own judgment of them no i take your opinions for granted and i tell you how i should set to work myself if they were my opinions too and that's a guinea's worth a devilish good guinea's worth to a rich man like you old sharon's logic produced a certain effect on mr troy in spite of himself it was smartly put from his point of view there was no denying that even if i consented to your proposal he said i should object to your annoying the young lady with impertinent questions or to your being introduced as a spy into a respectable house old sharon doubled his dirty fist and drummed with them on the rickety table in a comical frenzy of impatience while mr troy was speaking what the devil do you know about my way of doing business he burst out when the lawyer had done one of us two is talking like a born idiot and mind this it isn't me look here your young lady goes out for a walk and she meets with a dirty shabby old beggar i look like a shabby old beggar already don't i very good this dirty old wretch whines and whimpers and tells a long story and gets sixpence out of the girl and knows her by that time inside and out as well as if he had made her and mark hasn't asked her a single question and instead of annoying her has made her happy in the performance of a charitable action stop a bit i haven't done with you yet who blacks your boots and shoes look here he pushed his pug dog off his lap dived under the table appeared again with an old boot and a bottle of blackening and set to work with tigerish activity 
I'm going out for a walk, you know, and I may as well make myself smart. With that announcement, he began to sing over his work, a song of sentiment popular in England in the early part of the present century. She's all my fancy painted her. She's lovely, she's divine, but her heart it is another's, and it never can be mine. Tooraloo, I like a love song. Brush away, brush away, till I see my own pretty face in the blacking. Hey, here's a nice, harmless, jolly old man, sings and jokes over his work, and makes the kitchen quite cheerful. What's that, you say? He's a stranger, and don't talk to him too freely. You ought to be ashamed of yourself to speak in that way of a poor old fellow with one foot in the grave. Mrs. Cook will give him a nice bit of dinner in the scullery, and John Footman will look out for an old coat for him. And when he's heard everything he wants to hear and doesn't come back again the next day to his work, what do they think of it in the servants' hall? Do they say, we've had a spy among us? Yeah, you know better than that by this time. The cheerful old man had been run over in the street or is down with the fever or has turned up his toes in the parish dead house. That's what they say in the servants' hall. Try me in your own kitchen and see if your servants take me for a spy. Come, come, Mr. Lawyer, out with your ten pounds and don't waste any more precious time about it. I will consider and let you know, said Mr. Troy. Old Sharon laughed more ferociously than ever and hobbled round the table in a great hurry to the place at which Moody was sitting. He laid one hand on the steward's shoulder and pointed derisively with the other to Mr. Troy. I say, Mr. Silent Man, bet you five pounds I never hear of that lawyer again. Silently attentive all through the interview, except when he was answering questions, Moody only replied in the fewest words. I don't bet, was all he said. He showed no resentment at Sharon's familiarity, and he appeared to find no amusement in Sharon's extraordinary talk. The old vagabond seemed actually to produce a serious impression on him. When Mr. Troy set the example of rising to go, he still kept his seat and looked at the lawyer as if he regretted leaving the atmosphere of tobacco smoke reeking in the dirty room. Have you anything to say before we go? Mr. Troy asked. Moody rose slowly and looked at old Sharon. Not just now, sir, he replied, looking away again after a moment's reflection. Old Sharon interpreted Moody's look and Moody's reply from his own peculiar point of view. He suddenly drew the steward away into a corner of the room. I say, he began in a whisper, upon your solemn word of honor, you know, are you as rich as the lawyer there? Certainly not. Look here, it's half price to a poor man. If you feel like coming back on your own account, five pounds will do it from you. There, there, think of it, think of it. Now then, said Mr. Troy, waiting for his companion, with the door open in his hand. He looked back at Sharon when Moody joined him. The old vagabond was settled again in his armchair, with his dog in his lap, his pipe in his mouth, and his French novel in his hand, exhibiting exactly the picture of frowsy comfort which he had presented when his visitors first entered the room. Good day, said Mr. Troy, with haughty condescension. Don't interrupt me, rejoined old Sharon, absorbed in his novel. You've had your guinea's worth. Lord, what a lovely book this is. Don't interrupt me. Impudent scoundrel, said Mr. Troy, when he and Moody were in the street again. What could my friend mean by recommending him? Fancy his expecting me to trust him with ten pounds. I consider even the guinea completely thrown away. Begging your pardon, sir, said Moody. I don't quite agree with you there. What? You don't mean to tell me you understand that oracular sentence of his. Suspect the very last person on whom suspicion could possibly fall. Rubbish. 
I don't say I understand it, sir. I only say it has set me thinking. Thinking of what? Do your suspicions point to the thief? If you will please to excuse me, Mr. Troy, I should like to wait a while before I answer that. Mr. Troy suddenly stood still and eyed his companion a little distrustfully. Are you going to turn detective policeman on your own account? he asked. There's nothing I won't turn to and try to help Miss Isabel in this matter, Moody answered firmly. I have saved a few hundred pounds in Lady Lydiard's service, and I am ready to spend every farthing of it if I can only discover the thief. Mr. Troy walked on again. Miss Isabel seems to have a good friend in you, he said. He was, perhaps unconsciously, a little offended by the independent tone in which the steward spoke, after he had himself engaged to take the vindication of the girl's innocence into his own hands. Miss Isabel has a devoted servant and slave in me, Moody answered with passionate enthusiasm. Very creditable. I haven't a word to say against it, Mr. Troy rejoined. But don't forget that the young lady has other devoted friends besides you. I am her devoted friend, for instance. I have promised to serve her, and I mean to keep my word. You will excuse me for adding that my experience and discretion are quite as likely to be useful to her as your enthusiasm. I know the world well enough to be careful in trusting strangers. It will do you no harm, Mr. Moody, to follow my example. Moody accepted this reproof with becoming patience and resignation. If you have anything to propose, sir, that will be of service to Miss Isabel, he said, I shall be happy if I can assist you in the humblest capacity. And if not, Mr. Troy inquired, conscious of having nothing to propose as he asked the question. In that case, sir, I must take my own course and blame nobody but myself if it leads me astray. Mr. Troy said no more. He parted from Moody at the next turning. Pursuing the subject privately in his own mind, he decided on taking the earliest opportunity of visiting Isabel at her aunt's house, and on warning her, in her future intercourse with Moody, not to trust too much to the steward's discretion. I haven't a doubt, thought the lawyer, of what he means to do next. The infatuated fool is going back to old Sharon. End of Part 2, Chapter 9Part 2, Chapter 10 of My Lady's Money. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. My Lady's Money by Wilkie Collins. Part 2, Chapter 10. Returning to his office, Mr. Troy discovered among the correspondence that was waiting for him a letter from the very person whose welfare was still the uppermost subject in his mind. Isabel Miller wrote in these terms, Dear Sir, My aunt, Miss Pink, is very desirous of consulting you professionally at the earliest opportunity. Although South Morden is within little more than half an hour's railway ride from London, Miss Pink does not presume to ask you to visit her, being well aware of the value of your time. Will you therefore be so kind as to let me know when it will be convenient to you to receive my aunt at your office in London? Believe me, dear sir, respectfully yours, Isabel Miller. P.S. I am further instructed to say that the regrettable event at Lady Lydiard's house is the proposed subject of the consultation. The Lawn, South Morden, Thursday. Mr. Troy smiled as he read the letter. Too formal for a young girl, he said to himself. Every word of it has been dictated by Miss Pink. He was not long in deciding what course he should take. There was a pressing necessity for cautioning Isabel, and here was his opportunity. He sent for his head clerk and looked at his list of engagements for the day. 
there was nothing set down in the book which the clerk was not quite as well able to do as the master mr troy consulted his railway guide ordered his cab and caught the next train to south morden south morden was then and remains to this day one of those primitive agricultural villages passed over by the march of modern progress which are still to be found in the near neighbourhoods of london only the slow train stopped at the station and there was so little to do that the station-master and his porter grew flowers on the embankment and trained creepers over the waiting-room window turning your back on the railway and walking along the one street of south morden you found yourself in the old england of two centuries since gabled cottages with fast closed windows pigs and poultry in quiet possession of the road the venerable church surrounded by its shady burial ground the grocer's shop which sold everything and the butcher's shop which sold nothing the scarce inhabitants who liked a good look at a stranger and the unwashed children who were pictures of dirty health the clash of the iron chain bucket in the public well and the thump of the falling ninepins in the skittle ground behind the public house the horse pond on the one bit of open ground and the old elm tree with the wooden seat round it on the other these were some of the objects that you saw and some of the noises that you heard in south morden as you passed from one end of the village to the other about half a mile beyond the last of the old cottages modern england met you again under the form of a row of little villas set up by an adventurous london builder who had bought the land a bargain each villa stood in its own little garden and looked across a stony road at the meadowlands and softly rising wooded hills beyond each villa faced you in the sunshine with the horrid glare of new red brick and forced its nonsensical name on your attention traced in bright paint on the post of its entrance gate consulting the post as he advanced mr troy arrived in due course of time at the villa called the lawn in which derived its name apparently from a circular patch of grass in front of the house the gate resisting his efforts to open it he rang the bell admitted by a trim clean shy little maid-servant mr troy looked about him in amazement turn which way he might he found himself silently confronted by posted and painted instructions to visitors which forbade him to do this and commanded him to do that at every step of his progress from the gate to the house on the side of the lawn a label informed him that he was not to walk on the grass on the other side a painted hand pointed along a boundary wall to an inscription which warned him to go that way if he had business in the kitchen on the gravel walk at the foot of the house steps words neatly traced in little white shells reminded him not to forget the scraper on the doorstep he was informed in letters of lead that he was welcome on the mat in the passage bristly black words burst on his attention commanding him to wipe his shoes even the hat stand in the hall was not allowed to speak for itself it had hats and cloaks inscribed on it and it issued its directions imperatively in the matter of your wet umbrella put it here giving the trim little servant his card mr troy was introduced to a reception room on the lower floor before he had time to look round him the door was opened again from without and isabel stole into the room on tiptoe she looked worn and anxious when she shook hands with the old lawyer the charming smile that he remembered so well was gone don't say you've seen me she whispered i am not to come into the room until my aunt sends for me tell me two things before i run away again how is lady lydiard and have you discovered the thief lady lydiard was well when i last saw her and we have not yet succeeded in discovering the thief 
having answered the questions in these terms mr troy decided on cautioning isabel on the subject of the steward while he had the chance one question on my side he said holding her back from the door by the arm do you expect moody to visit you here i am sure he will visit me isabel answered warmly he has promised to come here at my request i never knew what a kind heart robert moody had till this misfortune fell on me my aunt who is not easily taken with strangers respects and admires him i can't tell you how good to me he was on the journey here and how kindly how nobly he spoke to me when we parted she paused and turned her head away the tears were rising in her eyes in my situation she said faintly kindness is very keenly felt don't notice me mr troy the lawyer waited a moment to let her recover herself i agree entirely my dear in your opinion of moody he said at the same time i think it right to warn you that his zeal in your service may possibly outrun his discretion he may feel too confidently about penetrating the mystery of the missing money and unless you are on your guard he may raise false hopes in you when you next see him listen to any advice that he may give you by all means but before you decide on being guided by his opinion consult my older experience and hear what i have to say on the subject don't suppose that i am attempting to make you distrust this good friend he added noticing the look of uneasy surprise which isabel fixed on him no such idea is in my mind i only warn you that moody's eagerness to be of service to you may mislead him you understand me yes sir replied elizabeth coldly i understand you please let me go now my aunt will be down directly and she must not find me here she curtsied with distant respect and left the room so much for trying to put two ideas together into a girl's mind thought mr troy when he was alone again the little fool evidently thinks i am jealous of moody's place in her estimation well i have done my duty and i can do no more he looked round the room not a chair was out of its place not a speck of dust was to be seen the brightly perfect polish of the table made your eyes ache the ornaments on it looked as if they had never been touched by mortal hand the piano was an object for distant admiration not an instrument to be played on the carpet made mr troy look nervously at the soles of his shoes and the sofa protected by layers of white crochet work said as plainly as if in words sit on me if you dare mr troy retreated to a bookcase at the further end of the room the books fitted the shelves to such absolute perfection that he had some difficulty in taking one of them out when he had succeeded he found himself in possession of a volume of the history of england on the fly-leaf he encountered another written warning this book belongs to miss pink's academy for young ladies and is not to be removed from the library the date which was added referred to a period of ten years since miss pink now stood revealed as a retired schoolmistress and mr troy began to understand some of the characteristic peculiarities of that lady's establishment which had puzzled him up to the present time he had just succeeded in putting the book back again when the door opened once more and isabel's aunt entered the room if miss pink could by any possible conjuncture of circumstances have disappeared mysteriously from her house and her friends the police would have found the greatest difficulty in composing the necessary description of the missing lady the acutest observer could have discovered nothing that was noticeable or characteristic in her personal appearance the pen of the present writer portrays her in despair 
by a series of negatives. She was not young, she was not old. She was neither tall nor short, nor stout nor thin. Nobody could call her features attractive, and nobody could call them ugly. There was nothing in her voice, her expression, her manner, or her dress that differed in any appreciable degree from the voice, expression, manner, and dress of 500,000 other single ladies of her age and position in the world. If you had asked her to describe herself, she would have answered, I am a gentlewoman. And if you had further inquired which of her numerous accomplishments took highest rank in her own esteem, she would have replied, My powers of conversation. For the rest, she was Miss Pink of South Morton, and when that had been said, all has been said. Pray be seated, sir. We have a beautiful day after the long-continued wet weather. I am told that the season is very unfavorable for wall fruit. May I offer you some refreshment after your journey? In these terms, and in the smoothest of voices, Miss Pink opened the interview. Mr. Troy made a polite reply and added a few strictly conventional remarks on the beauty of the neighborhood. Not even a lawyer could sit in Miss Pink's presence and hear Miss Pink's conversation without feeling himself called upon, in the nursery phrase, to be on his best behavior. It is extremely kind of you, Mr. Troy, to favor me with this visit, Miss Pink resumed. I am well aware that the time of professional gentlemen is of a special value to them, and I will therefore ask you to excuse me if I proceed abruptly to the subject on which I desire to consult your experience. Here the lady modestly smoothed out her dress over her knees, and the lawyer made a bow. Miss Pink's highly trained conversation had perhaps one fault. It was not, strictly speaking, conversation at all. In its effect on her hearers, it rather resembled the contents of a fluently conventional letter read aloud. The circumstances under which my niece Isabel has left Lady Lydiard's house, Miss Pink proceeded, are so indescribably painful, I will go no further, I will say so deeply humiliating, that I have forbidden her to refer to them again in my presence, or to mention them in the future to any living creature besides myself. You are acquainted with those circumstances, Mr. Troy, and you will understand my indignation when I first learnt that my sister's child had been suspected of theft. I have not the honour of being acquainted with Lady Lydiard. She is not a countess, I believe, just so. Her husband was only a baron. I am not acquainted with Lady Lydiard, and I will not trust myself to say what I think of her conduct to my niece. Pardon me, madam, Mr. Troy interposed. Before you say any more about Lady Lydiard, I really must beg leave to observe. Pardon me, Miss Pink rejoined. I never form a hasty judgment. Lady Lydiard's conduct is beyond the reach of any defense, no matter how ingenious it may be. You may not be aware, sir, that in receiving my niece under her roof, her ladyship was receiving a gentlewoman by birth, as well as by education. My late lamented sister was the daughter of a clergyman of the Church of England. I need hardly remind you that, as such, she was a born lady. Under favoring circumstances, Isabel's maternal grandfather might have been Archbishop of Canterbury, and have taken precedence of the whole House of Peers, the Princes of the Blood Royal alone excepted. I am not prepared to say that my niece is equally well connected on her father's side. My sister surprised. I will not add shocked us when she married a chemist. At the same time, a chemist is not a tradesman. He is a gentleman at one end of the profession of medicine. 
and a titled physician is a gentleman at the other end. That is all. In inviting Isabel to reside with her, Lady Lydiard, I repeat, was bound to remember that she was associating herself with a young gentlewoman. She has not remembered this, which is one insult, and she has suspected my niece of theft, which is another. Miss Pink paused to take breath. Mr. Troy made a second attempt to get a hearing. Will you kindly permit me, madam, to say a few words? No, said Miss Pink, asserting the most immovable obstinacy under the blandest politeness of manner. Your time, Mr. Troy, is really too valuable. Not even your trained intellect can excuse conduct which is so manifestly inexcusable on the face of it. Now you know my opinion of Lady Lydiard, you will not be surprised to hear that I decline to trust her ladyship. She may or she may not cause the necessary inquiries to be made for the vindication of my niece's character. In a matter so serious as this, I may say, in a duty which I owe to the memories of my sister and my parents, I will not leave the responsibility to Lady Lydiard. I will take it on myself. Let me add that I am able to pay the necessary expenses. The earlier years of my life, Mr. Troy, have been passed in the tuition of young ladies. I have been happy in meriting the confidence of parents, and I have been strict in observing the golden rules of economy. On my retirement, I have been able to invest a modest, a very modest, little fortune in the funds. A portion of it is at the service of my niece for the recovery of her good name, and I desire you to place the necessary investigation confidentially in your hands. You are acquainted with the case, and the case naturally goes to you. I could not prevail on myself, I really could not prevail on myself, to mention it to a stranger. That is the business on which I wish to consult you. Please say nothing more about Lady Lydiard. The subject is inexpressibly disagreeable to me. I will only trespass on your kindness to tell me if I have succeeded in making myself understood. Miss Pink leaned back in her chair at the exact angle permitted by the laws of propriety, rested her left elbow on the palm of her right hand, and lightly supported her cheek with her forefinger and thumb. In this position, she waited Mr. Troy's answer, the living picture of human obstinacy in its most respectable form. If Mr. Troy had not been a lawyer, in other words, if he had not been professionally capable of persisting in his own course in the face of every conceivable difficulty and discouragement, Miss Pink might have remained in undisturbed possession of her own opinions. As it was, Mr. Troy had got his hearing at last, and no matter how obstinately she might close her eyes to it, Miss Pink was now destined to have the other side of the case presented to her view. I am sincerely obliged to you, madam, for the expression of your confidence in me, Mr. Troy began. At the same time, I must beg you to excuse me if I decline to accept your proposal. Miss Pink had not expected to receive such an answer as this. The lawyer's brief refusal surprised and annoyed her. Why do you decline to assist me? she asked. Because, answered Mr. Troy, my services are already engaged in Miss Isabel's interest by a client whom I have served for more than twenty years. My client is... Miss Pink anticipated the coming disclosure. You need not trouble yourself, sir, to mention your client's name, she said. My client, persisted Mr. Troy, loves Miss Isabel dearly. That is a matter of opinion, Miss Pink interposed and believes in Miss Isabel's innocence, proceeded the irrepressible lawyer, as firmly as you believe in it yourself. Miss Pink, being human, had a temper, and Mr. Troy had found his way to it. 
If Lady Lydiard believes in my niece's innocence, said Miss Pink, suddenly sitting bolt upright in her chair, why has my niece been compelled, in justice to herself, to leave Lady Lydiard's house? You will admit, madam, Mr. Troy answered cautiously, that we are all of us liable in this wicked world to be the victims of appearances. Your niece is a victim, an innocent victim. She wisely withdraws from Lady Lydiard's house until appearances are proved to be false and her position is cleared up. Miss Pink had her reply ready. That is simply acknowledging, in other words, that my niece is suspected. I am only a woman, Mr. Troy, but it is not quite so easy to mislead me as you seem to suppose. Mr. Troy's temper was admirably trained, but it began to acknowledge that Miss Pink's powers of irritation could sting to some purpose. No intention of misleading you, madam, has ever crossed my mind, he rejoined warmly. As for your niece, I can tell you this. In all my experience of Lady Lydiard, I never saw her so distressed as she was when Miss Isabel left the house. Indeed, said Miss Pink, with an incredulous smile. In my rank of life, when we feel distressed about a person, we do our best to comfort that person by a kind letter or an early visit. But then, I am not a lady of title. Lady Lynyard engaged herself to call on Miss Isabel in my hearing, said Mr. Troy. Lady Lydiard is the most generous woman living. Lady Lydiard is here, cried a joyful voice on the other side of the door. At the same moment, Isabel burst into the room in a state of excitement, which actually ignored the formidable presence of Miss Pink. I beg your pardon, aunt. I was upstairs at the window, and I saw the carriage stop at the gate. And Tommy has come, too. The darling saw me at the window, cried the poor girl, her eyes sparkling with delight, as a perfect explosion of barking made itself heard over the tramp of horses' feet and the crash of carriage wheels outside. Miss Pink rose slowly, with a dignity that looked capable of adequately receiving not one noble lady only, but the whole peerage of England. Control yourself, dear Isabel, she said. No well-bred young lady permits herself to become unduly excited. Stand by my side, a little behind me. Isabel obeyed. Mr. Troy kept his place and privately enjoyed his triumph over Miss Pink. If Lady Lydiard had been actually in league with him, she could not have chosen a more opportune time for her visit. A momentary interval passed. The carriage drew up at the door, the horses trampled on the gravel, the bell rung madly, the uproar of Tommy, released from the carriage and clamoring to be let in, redoubled its fury. Never before had such an unruly burst of noises invaded the tranquility of Miss Pink's villa. End of part two, chapter ten. Chapter 11 of My Lady's Money. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. My Lady's Money by Wilkie Collins. Chapter 11. The trim little maidservant ran upstairs from her modest little kitchen, trembling at the terrible prospect of having to open the door. Miss Pink, deafened by the barking, had just time to say, What a very ill-behaved dog, when a sound of small objects overthrown in the hall and a scurrying of furious claws across the oilcloth announced that Tommy had invaded the house. As the servant appeared, introducing Lady Lydiard, the dog ran in, he made one frantic leap at Isabel, which would certainly have knocked her down but for the chair that happened to be standing behind her. Received on her lap, the faithful creature half smothered her with his caresses. 
He barked, he shrieked in his joy at seeing her again. He jumped off her lap and tore round and round the room at the top of his speed. And every time he passed Miss Pink, he showed the whole range of his teeth and snarled ferociously at her ankles. Having at last exhausted his superfluous energy, he leaped back again on Isabel's lap, with his tongue quithering in his open mouth, his tail wagging softly, and his eye on Miss Pink, inquiring how she liked a dog in her drawing room. I hope my dog has not disturbed you, ma'am, said Lady Lydiard, advancing from the mat at the doorway, on which she had patiently waited until the raptures of Tommy subsided into repose. Miss Pink, trembling between terror and indignation, acknowledged Lady Lydiard's polite inquiry by a ceremonious bow and an answer which administered by implication a dignified reproof. Her ladyship's dog does not appear to be a very well-trained animal, the ex-schoolmistress remarked. Well-trained, Lady Lydiard repeated, as if the expression was perfectly unintelligible to her. I don't think you have had much experience of dogs, ma'am. She turned to Isabel and embraced her tenderly. Give me a kiss, my dear. You don't know how wretched I have been since you left me. She looked back again at Miss Pink. You are not, perhaps, aware, ma'am, that my dog is devotedly attached to your niece. A dog's love has been considered by many great men, whose names at the moment escape me as the most touching and disinterested of all earthly affections. She looked the other way and discovered the lawyer. How do you do, Mr. Troy? It's a pleasant surprise to find you here. The house was so dull without Isabel that I really couldn't put off seeing her any longer. When you are more used to Tommy, Miss Pink, you will understand and admire him. You understand and admire him, Isabel, don't you? My child, you are not looking well. I shall take you back with me when the horses have had their rest. We shall never be happy away from each other. Having expressed her sentiments, distributed her greetings, and defended her dog, all as it were in one breath, Lady Lydiard sat down by Isabel's side and opened a large green fan that hung at her girdle. You have no idea, Miss Pink, how fat people suffer in hot weather, said the old lady, using her fan vigorously. Miss Pink's eyes dropped modestly to the ground. Fat was such a coarse word to use if a lady must speak of her own superfluous flesh. May I offer some refreshment? Miss Pink asked mincingly. A cup of tea? Lady Lydiard shook her head. A glass of water? Lady Lydiard declined this, this last hospitable proposal with an exclamation of disgust. Have you got any beer? she inquired. Beg your ladyship's pardon, said Miss Pink, doubting the evidence of her own ears. Did you say beer? Lady Lydia gesticulated vehemently with her fan. Yes, to be sure, beer, beer. Miss Pink rose with a countenance expressive of genteel disgust and rang the bell. I think you have beer downstairs, Susan, she said when the maid appeared at the door. Yes, miss. A glass of beer for Lady Lydiard, said Miss Pink, under protest. Bring it in a jug, shouted her ladyship as the maid left the room. I like to froth it up for myself, she continued, addressing Miss Pink. Isabel sometimes does it for me when she is at home, don't you, my dear? Miss Pink had been waiting her opportunity to assert her own claim to the possession of her own niece. 
from the time when Lady Lydiard had coolly declared her intention of taking Isabel back with her. The opportunity now presented itself. Your ladyship will pardon me, she said, if I remark that my niece's home is under my humble roof. I am properly sensible, I hope, of your kindness to Isabel, for while she remains the object of a disgraceful suspicion, she remains with me. Lady Lydiard closed her fan with an angry snap. You are completely mistaken, Miss Pink. You may not mean it, but you speak most unjustly if you say that your niece is an object of suspicion to me, or to anybody in my house. Mr. Troy, quietly listening up to this point, now interposed to stop the discussion before it could degenerate into a personal quarrel. His keen observation, aided by his accurate knowledge of his client's character, had plainly revealed to him what was passing in Lady Lydiard's mind. She had entered the house feeling, perhaps unconsciously, a jealousy of Miss Pink as her predecessor in Isabel's affections and as the natural protectress of the girl under existing circumstances. Miss Pink's reception of her dog had additionally irritated the old lady. She had taken a malicious pleasure in shocking the schoolmistress's sense of propriety, and she was now only too ready to proceed to further extremities on the delicate question of Isabel's justification for leaving her house. For Isabel's own sake, therefore, to say nothing of other reasons, it was urgently desirable to keep the peace between the two ladies. With this excellent object in view, Mr. Troy seized his opportunity of striking into the conversation for the first time. Pardon me, Lady Lydiard, he said. You are speaking of a subject which has been already sufficiently discussed between Miss Pink and myself. I think we shall do better not to dwell uselessly on past events, but to direct our attention to the future. We are all equally satisfied of the complete rectitude of Miss Isabel's conduct and we are all equally interested in the vindication of her good name. Whether these temperate words would of themselves have exercised the pacifying influence at which Mr. Troy aimed may be doubtful, but as he ceased speaking, a powerful auxiliary appeared in the shape of the beer. Lady Lydiard seized on the jug and filled the tumbler for herself with an unsteady hand. Miss Pink, trembling for the integrity of her carpet, and scandalised at seeing a peeress drinking beer like a washerwoman, forgot the sharp answer that was just rising to her lips when the lawyer interfered. Small, said Lady Lydiard, setting down the empty tumbler, and referring to the quality of the beer, but very pleasant and refreshing. What's the servant's name? Susan. Well, Susan, I was dying of thirst, and you have saved my life. You can leave the jug. I dare say I shall empty it before I go. Mr. Troy, watching Miss Pink's face, saw that it was time to change the subject again. Did you notice the old village, Lady Lydiard, on your way here? he asked. The artists consider it one of the most picturesque places in England. I noticed that it was a very dirty village, Lady Lydiard answered, still bent on making herself disagreeable to Miss Pink. The artists may say what they please. I see nothing to admire in rotten cottages and bad drainage and ignorant people. I suppose the neighbourhood has its advantages. It looks dull enough to my mind. Isabel had hitherto modestly restricted her exertions to keeping Tommy quiet on her lap. Like Mr. Troy, she occasionally looked at her aunt, and she now made a timid attempt to defend the neighbourhood as a duty that she owed to Miss Pink. Oh, my lady, don't say it's a dull neighbourhood, she pleaded. There are such pretty walks all round us. And when you get to the hills, the view is beautiful. 
Lady Lydiard's answer to this was a little masterpiece of good-humoured contempt. She patted Isabel's cheek and said, Pooh, pooh, your ladyship does not admire the beauties of nature, Miss Pink remarked with a compassionate smile. As we get older, no doubt, our sight begins to fail, and we leave off canting about the beauties of nature, added Lady Lydiard. I hate the country. Give me London and the pleasures of society. Come, come, do the country justice, Lady Lydiard, put in peacemaking Mr. Troy. There is plenty of society to be found out of London, as good society as the world can show. The sort of society, added Miss Pink, which is to be found, for example, in this neighbourhood. Her ladyship is evidently not aware that persons of distinction surround us, whichever way we turn. I may instance, among others, the Honourable Mr. Hardyman. Lady Lydiard, in the act of pouring out a second glass full of beer, suddenly set down the jug. Who is that you're talking of, Miss Pink? I am talking of our neighbour, Lady Lydiard, the Honourable Mr. Hardyman. Do you mean Alfred Hardyman, the man who breeds horses? The distinguished gentleman who owns the famous stud farm, said Miss Pink correcting the bluntly direct form in which Lady Lydiard had put her question. "'Is he in the habit of visiting here?' the old lady inquired, with a sudden appearance of anxiety. "'Do you know him? I had the honour of being introduced to Mr. Hardyman at our last flower show,' Miss Pink replied. "'He has not yet favoured me with a visit.' Lady Lydiard's anxiety appeared to be to some extent relieved. I knew that Hardyman's farm was in this county, she said, but I had no notion that it was in the neighbourhood of South Morden. How far away is he? Ten or a dozen miles, eh? Not more than three miles, answered Miss Pink. We consider him quite a neighbour of ours. Renewed anxiety showed itself in Lady Lydiard. She looked round sharply at Isabel. The girl's head was bent so low over the rough head of the dog that her face was almost entirely concealed from view. So far as appearances went, she seemed to be entirely absorbed in fondling Tommy. Lady Lydiard roused her with a tap of the green fan. Take Tommy out, Isabel, for a run in the garden, she said. He won't sit much longer, and he may annoy Miss Pink. Mr. Troy, will you kindly help Isabel to keep my ill-trained dog in order? Mr. Troy got on his feet, and not very willingly, followed Isabel out of the room. They will quarrel now to a dead certainty, he thought to himself as he closed the door. Have you any idea of what this means, he said to his companion as he joined her in the hall. What has Mr. Hardyman done to excite all this interest in him? Isabel's guilty colour rose. She knew perfectly well that Hardyman's unconcealed admiration of her was the guiding motive of Lady Lydiard's inquiries. If she had told the truth, Mr. Troy would have unquestionably returned to the drawing room, with or without an acceptable excuse for intruding himself. But Isabel was a woman, and her answer, it is needless to say, was, I don't know, I'm sure. In the meantime, the interview between the two ladies began in a manner which would have astonished Mr. Troy. They were both silent. For once in her life, Lady Lydiard was considering what she should say before she said it. Miss Pink, on her side, naturally waited to hear what object her ladyship had in view, waited until her small reserve of patience gave way. Urged by irresistible curiosity, she spoke first. Have you anything to say to me in private? she asked. Lady Lydiard had not got to the end of her reflections. She said, yes, and she said no more. Is it anything relating to my niece? persisted Miss Pink. 
still immersed in her reflections, Lady Lydiard suddenly rose to the surface and spoke her mind as usual. About your niece, ma'am, the other day Mr. Hardyman called at my house and saw Isabel. Yes, said Mr. Pink, politely attentive, but not in the least interested so far. That's not all, ma'am. Mr. Hardyman admires Isabel. He owned it to me himself in so many words. Miss Pink listened, with a courteous inclination of her head. She looked mildly gratified, nothing more. Lady Lydiard proceeded. You and I think differently on many matters, she said. But we are both agreed, I am sure, in feeling the sincerest interest in Isabel's welfare. I beg to suggest to you, Miss Pink, that Mr. Hardyman, as a near neighbour of yours, is a very undesirable neighbour while Isabel remains in your house. Saying those words, under a strong conviction of the serious importance of the subject, Lady Lydiard insensibly recovered the manner and resumed the language which befitted a lady of her rank. Miss Pink, noticing the change, set it down to an expression of pride on the part of her visitor which, in referring to Isabel, assailed indirectly the social position of Isabel's aunt. I fail entirely to understand what your ladyship means, she said coldly. Lady Lydiard, on her side, looked in undisguised amazement at Miss Pink. Haven't I told you already that Mr. Hardyman admires your niece? she asked. Naturally, said Miss Pink. Isabel inherits her lamented mother's personal advantages. If Mr. Hardyman admires her, Mr. Hardyman shows his good taste. Lady Lydiard's eyes opened wider and wider in wonder. My good lady, she exclaimed. Is it possible you don't know that when a man admires a woman, he doesn't stop there? He falls in love with her, as the saying is, next. So I have heard, said Miss Pink. So you have heard, repeated Lady Lydiard. If Mr. Hardyman finds his way to Isabel, I can tell you what you will see. Catch the two together, ma'am, and you will see Mr. Hardyman making love to your niece. Under due restrictions, Lady Lydiard, and with my permission first obtained, of course, I see no objection to Mr. Hardyman paying his addresses to Isabel. The woman is mad, cried Lady Lydiard. Do you actually suppose, Miss Pink, that Alfred Hardyman could, by any earthly possibility, marry your niece? Not even Miss Pink's politeness could submit to such a question as this. She rose indignantly from her chair. Are you aware, Lady Lydiard, that the doubt you have just expressed is an insult to my niece and an insult to me? Are you aware of who Mr. Hardyman really is, retorted her ladyship? Or do you judge of his position by the vocation in life which he has perversely chosen to adopt? I can tell you, if you do, that Alfred Hardyman is the younger son of one of the oldest barons in the English peerage, and that his mother is related by marriage to the royal family of Württemberg. Miss Pink received the full shock of this information without proceeding from her position by a hair breadth. An English gentlewoman offers a fit alliance to any man who seeks her hand in marriage, said Miss Pink. Isabel's mother, you may not be aware of it, was the daughter of an English clergyman. And Isabel's father was a chemist in a country town, added Lady Lydiard. Isabel's father, rejoined Miss Pink, was attached in a most responsible capacity to the useful and honourable profession of medicine. Isabel is, in the strictest sense of the word, a young gentleman. If you contradict that for a single instant, Lady Lydiard, you will oblige me to leave the room. 
Those last words produced a result which Miss Pink had not anticipated. They roused Lady Lydiard to assert herself. As usual in such cases, she rose superior to her own eccentricity. Confronting Miss Pink, she now spoke and looked with a gracious courtesy and the unpresuming self-confidence of the order to which she belonged. For Isabel's own sake and for the quieting of my conscience, she answered. I will say one word more, Miss Pink, before I relieve you of my presence. Considering my age and my opportunities, I may claim to know quite as much as you do of the laws and customs which regulate society in our time. Without contesting your niece's social position, and without the slightest intention of insulting you, I repeat that the rank which Mr. Hardyman inherits makes it simply impossible for him to even think of marrying Isabel. You will do well not to give him any opportunities of meeting with her alone, and you will do better still, seeing that he is so near a neighbour of yours, if you permit Isabel to return to my protection. For a time at least. I will wait to hear from you when you have thought the matter over at your leisure. In the meantime, if I have inadvertently offended you, I ask your pardon, and I wish you good evening. She bowed and walked to the door. Miss Pink, as resolute as ever in maintaining her pretension, made an effort to match the great lady on her own ground. Before you go, Lady Lydiard, I beg to apologise if I have spoken too warmly on my side, she said. Permit me to send for your carriage. Thank you, Miss Pink. My carriage is only at the village inn. I shall enjoy a little walk in the cool evening air. Mr. Troy, I have no doubt, will give me his arm. She bowed once more and quietly left the room, reaching the little back garden of the villa. Through an open door at the further end of the hall, Lady Lydiard found Tommy rolling luxuriously on Miss Pink's flower beds, and Isabel and Mr. Troy in close consultation on the gravel walk. She spoke to the lawyer first. They are baiting the horses at the inn, she said. I want your arm, Mr. Troy, as far as the village, and, in return, I will take you back to London with me. I have to ask your advice about one or two little matters, and this is a good opportunity. With the greatest pleasure, Lady Lydiard. I suppose I must say goodbye to Miss Pink. A word of advice to you, Mr. Troy. Take care how you ruffle Miss Pink's sense of her own importance. Another word for your private ear. Miss Pink is a fool. On the lawyer's withdrawal, Lady Lydiard put her arm fondly round Isabel's waist. What were you and Mr. Troy so busy in talking about? she asked. We were talking, my lady, about tracing the person who stole the money, Isabel answered rather sadly. It seems a far more difficult matter than I supposed it to be. I try not to lose patience and hope. But it is a little hard to feel that appearances are against me and to wait day after day in vain for the discovery that is to set me right. You are a dear good child, said Lady Lydiard, and you are more precious to me than ever. Don't despair, Isabel. With Mr. Troy's means of inquiring and with my means of paying, the discovery of the thief could not be much longer delayed. If you don't return to me soon, I shall come back and see you again. Your aunt hates the sight of me, but I don't care two straws for that, remarked Lady Lydiard, showing the undignified side of her character once more. Listen to me, Isabel. I have no wish to lower your aunt in your estimation, but I feel far more confidence in your good sense than in hers. Mr. Hardyman's business has taken him to France for the present. It is at least possible that you may meet him on his return. 
If you do, keep him at a distance, my dear. Politely, of course. There, there, you needn't turn red. I am not blaming you. I am only giving you a little good advice. In your position, you cannot possibly be too careful. Here is Mr. Troy. You must come to the gate with us, Isabel, or we shall never get Tommy away from you. I am only his second favourite. You have the first place in his affections. God bless and prosper you, my child. I wish to heaven you were going back to London with me. Well, Mr. Troy, how have you done with Miss Pink? Have you offended that terrible gentlewoman? Hateful word. Or has it been all the other way, and has she given you a kiss at parting? Mr. Troy smiled mysteriously and changed the subject. His brief parting interview with the lady of the house was not of a nature to be rashly related. Miss Pink had not only positively assured him that her visitor was the most ill-bred woman she had ever met with, but had further accused Lady Lydiard of shaking her confidence in the aristocracy of her native country. For the first time in my life, said Miss Pink, I feel that something is to be said for the Republican point of view, and I am not indisposed to admit that the Constitution of the United States has its advantages. End of chapter 12 Recording by Emma Charlotte Chapter 12 of My Lady's Money This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. My Lady's Money by Wilkie Collins Chapter 12 The conference between Lady Lydiard and Mr. Troy on the way back to London led to some practical results. Hearing from the legal adviser that the inquiry after the missing money was for a moment at a standstill, Lady Lydiard made one of those bold suggestions with which she was accustomed to startle her friends in cases of emergency. She had heard favourable reports of the extraordinary ingenuity of the French police, and she now proposed sending to Paris for assistance after first consulting her nephew, Mr. Felix Sweetsir. Felix knows Paris as well as he knows London, she remarked. He is an idle man, and it is quite likely that he will relieve us of our all trouble by taking the matter into his own hands. In any case, he is sure to know who are the right people to address in our present necessity. What to say? Mr. Troy, in reply, expressed his doubts as to the wisdom of employing foreigners in a delicate investigation which required an accurate knowledge of English customs and English character. Waiving this objection, he approved of the idea of consulting her ladyship's nephew. Mr. Sweetsir is a man of the world, he said. In putting the case before him, we are sure to have it presented to us from a new point of view. Acting on this favourable expression of opinion, Lady Lydiard wrote to her nephew. On the day after the visit to Miss Pink, the proposed Council of Free was held at Lady Lydiard's house. Felix, never punctual at keeping an appointment, was even later than usual on this occasion. He made his apologies with his hand pressed upon his forehead and his voice expressive of the languor and discouragement of a suffering man. The beastly English climate is telling on my nerves, said Mr. Sweetsir. The horrid weight of the atmosphere after the exhilarating air of Paris, the intolerable dirt and dullness of London, you know. I was in bed, my dear aunt, when I received your letter. You may imagine the completely demoralised state I was in when I tell you of the effect which the news of the robbery produced on me. I fell back on my pillow as if I had been shot. 
your ladyship should really be a little more careful in communicating these disagreeable surprises to a sensitively organized man never mind my valet is a perfect treasure he brought me some drops of ether on a lump of sugar i said alfred his name is alfred put me into my clothes alfred put me in i assure you it reminded me of my young days when i was put into my first pair of trousers has alfred forgotten anything have i got my braces on have i come out in my shirt sleeves well dear aunt well mr troy what can i say what can i do lady lydiard entirely without sympathy for nervous suffering nodded to the lawyer you tell him she said i believe i speak for her ladyship mr troy began when i say that we should like to hear in the first place how the whole case strikes you mr sweet sir tell me it all over again said felix patient mr troy told it all over again and waited for the result well said felix well said mr troy where does the suspicion of robbery rest in your opinion you look at the theft of the banknote with a fresh eye you mentioned a clergyman just now said felix the man you know to whom the money was sent what was his name the reverend samuel bradstock you want me to name the person whom i suspect yes if you please said mr troy i suspect the reverend samuel bradstock said felix if you have come here to make stupid jokes interposed lady lydiard you had better go back to your bed again we want a serious opinion you have a serious opinion felix coolly rejoined i never was more in earnest in my life your ladyship is not aware of the first principle to be adopted in cases of suspicion one proceeds on what i call the exhaustive system of reasoning thus does suspicion point to the honest servants downstairs no to your ladyship's adopted daughter appearances are against the poor girl but you know her better than to trust to appearances are you suspicious of moody no of hardyman who was in the house at the time ridiculous but i was in the house at the time too do you suspect me just so that idea is ridiculous too now let us sum up servants adopted daughter moody hardyman sweet sir all beyond suspicion who is left the reverend samuel bradstock this ingenious exposition of the exhaustive system of reasoning failed to produce any effect on lady lydiard you are wasting our time she said sharply you know as well as i do that you are talking nonsense i don't said felix taking the gentlemanly professions all round i know of no men who are so eager to get money and who have so few scruples about how they get it as the parsons where is there a man in any other profession who perpetually worries you for money who holds the bag under your nose for money who sends his clerk round from door to door to beg a few shillings of you and calls it an easter offering the parson does all this bradstock is a parson i put it logically bowl me over if you can mr troy attempted to bowl him over nevertheless lady lydiard wisely interposed when a man persists in talking nonsense she said silence is the best answer anything else only encourages him she turned to felix i have a question to ask you she went on you will either give me a serious reply or wish me good morning with this brief preface she made her inquiry as to the wisdom and possibility of engaging the services of the french police felix took exactly the view of the matter which had been already expressed by mr troy superior in intelligence he said but not superior in courage to the english police 
capable of performing wonders on their own ground and among their own people. But, my dear aunt, the two most dissimilar nations on the face of the earth are the English and the French. The French police may speak our language, but they are incapable of understanding our national character and our national manners. Set them to work on a private inquiry in the city of Pekin, and they would get on in time with the Chinese people. Set them to work in the city of London, and the English people would remain, from first to last, the same impenetrable mystery to them. In my belief, the London Sunday would be enough of itself to drive them back to Paris in despair. No balls, no concerts, no theatres, not even a museum or a picture gallery open. Every shop shut up but the gin shop, and nothing moving but the church bells and the men who sell the penny ices. Hundreds of Frenchmen come to see me on their first arrival in England. Every man of them rushes back to Paris on the second Saturday of his visit, rather than confront the horrors of a second Sunday in London. However, you can try it if you like. Send me a written abstract of the case, and I will forward it to one of the official people in the Rue Jerusalem, who will do anything he can to oblige me. Of course, said Felix, turning to Mr. Troy. Some of you have got the number of the lost banknote. If the thief has tried to pass it in Paris, my man may be of some use to you. Three of us have got the number of the note, answered Mr. Troy. Miss Isabel Miller, Mr. Moody, and myself. Very good, said Felix. Send me the number, with the abstract of the case. Is there anything else I can do towards recovering the money? He asked, turning to his aunt. There is one lucky circumstance in connection with this loss, isn't there? It has fallen on a person who is rich enough to take it easy. Good heavens, suppose it had been my loss. It has fallen doubly on me, said Lady Lydiard, and I am certainly not rich enough to take it that easy. The money was destined to be a charitable purpose, and have felt it my duty to pay it again. Felix rose and approached his aunt's chair with faltering step, as became a suffering man. He took Lady Lydiard's hand and kissed it with enthusiastic admiration. You excellent creature, he said. You may not think it, but you reconcile me to human nature. How generous, how noble. I think I'll go to bed again, Mr. Troy. If you really don't want any more of me, my head feels giddy and my legs tremble under me. It doesn't matter. I shall feel easier when Alfred has taken me out of my clothes again. God bless you, my dear aunt. I never felt so proud of being related to you as I do today. Good morning, Mr. Troy. Don't forget the abstract of the case, and don't trouble yourself to see me to the door. I dare say I shan't tumble downstairs, and if I do... There's the porter in the hall to pick me up again. Enviable porter, as fat as butter and as idle as a pig. Au revoir, au revoir. He kissed his hand and drifted feebly out of the room. Sweet, sir, one might say, in a state of eclipse, but still the serviceable sweet, sir who was never consulted in vain by the fortunate people privileged to call him friend. Is he really ill, do you think? Mr. Troy asked. My nephew has turned fifty, Lady Lydiard answered, and he persists in living as if he was a young man. Every now and then nature says to him, Felix, you are old, and Felix goes to bed and says it's his nerves. I suppose he is to be trusted to keep his word about writing to Paris, pursued the lawyer. Oh, yes, he may delay doing it, but he will do it. In spite of his lackadaisical manner, he has moments of energy that would surprise you. 
Talking of surprises, I have something to tell you about Moody. Within the last day or two, there has been a marked change in him, a change for the worse. You astonish me, Lady Lydiard. In what way has Moody deteriorated? You shall hear. Yesterday was Friday. You took him out with you, on business, early in the morning. Mr. Troy bowed and said nothing. He had not thought it desirable to mention the interview at which old Sharon had cheated him of his guinea. In the course of the afternoon, pursued Lady Lydiard, I happened to want him, and I was informed that Moody had gone out again. Where had he gone? Nobody knew. Had he left word when he would be back? He had left no message of any sort. Of course, he is not in the position of an ordinary servant. I don't expect him to ask permission to go out. But I do expect him to leave word downstairs of the time at which he is likely to return. When he did come back, after an absence of some hours, I naturally asked for an explanation. Would you believe it? He simply informed me that he had been away on business of his own, expressed no regret, and offered no explanation. In short, spoke as if he was an independent gentleman. You may not think it, but I kept my temper. I merely remarked that I hoped it would not happen again. He made me a bow, and he said, My business is not completed yet, my lady. I cannot guarantee that it may not call me away again at a moment's notice. What do you think of that? Nine people out of ten would have given him warning to leave their service. I begin to think I am a wonderful woman. I only pointed to the door. One does hear sometimes of men's brains softening in the most unexpected manner. I have my suspicions of Moody's brains, I can tell you. Mr. Troy's suspicions took a different direction. They pointed along the line of streets which led to old Sharon's lodging. Discreetly silent as to the turn which his thoughts had taken, he merely expressed himself as feeling too much surprised to offer any opinion at all. Wait a little, said Lady Lydiard. I haven't done surprising you yet. You have seen a boy here in Page's livery, I think. Well, he is a good boy, and he has gone home for a week's holiday with his friends. The proper person to supply his place with the boots and shoes and other small employments is, of course, the youngest footman, a lad only a few years older than himself. What do you think Moody does? Engages a stranger with the house full of idle men servants already to fill the page's place. What do you think Moody does? Engages a stranger with the house full of idle men servants already to fill the page's place. At intervals this morning I heard them wonderfully merry in the servants' hall, so merry that the noise and laughter found its way upstairs to the breakfast room. I like my servants to be in good spirits, but it certainly did strike me that they were getting beyond reasonable limits. I questioned my maid and was informed that the noise was all due to the jokes of the strangest old man that ever was seen. In other words, to the person whom my steward had taken it on himself to engage in the page's absence. I spoke to Moody on the subject. He answered in an odd, confused way that he had exercised his discretion to the best of his judgment and that, if I wished it, he would tell the old man to keep his good spirits under better control. I asked him how he came to hear of the man. He only answered, By accident, my lady. And not one more word could I get out of him, good or bad. Moody engages the servants, as you know, but on every other occasion he has invariably consulted me before an engagement was settled. I really don't feel at all sure about this person who has been so strangely introduced into the house. He may be a drunkard or a thief. I wish you would speak to Moody yourself, Mr. Troy. Do you mind ringing the bell? Mr. Troy rose as a matter of course and rang the bell. He was by this time, it is needless to say, convinced that Moody had not only gone back to consult old Sharon on his own responsibility, but worse still, had taken the unwarrantable liberty of introducing him 
as a spy into the house. To communicate this explanation to Lady Lydiard would, in her present humour, be simply to produce the dismissal of the steward from her service. The only other alternative was to ask leave to interrogate Moody privately, and after duly reproving him, to insist on the departure of Old Sharon as the one condition on which Mr. Troy would consent to keep Lady Lydiard in ignorance of the truth. I think I shall manage better with Moody if your ladyship will permit me to see him in private, the lawyer said. Shall I go downstairs and speak with him in his own room? Why should you trouble yourself to do that? said her ladyship. See him here, and I will go into the boudoir. As she made that reply, the footman appeared at the drawing-room door. Send Moody here, said Lady Lydiard. The footman's answer, delivered at that moment, assumed an importance which was not expressed in the footman's words. My lady, he said, Mr. Moody has gone out. End of chapter 12. Recording by Emma Charlotte. Chapter 13 of My Lady's Money. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. My Lady's Money by Wilkie Collins. Chapter 13. While the strange proceedings of the steward were the subject of conversation between Lady Lydiard and Mr. Troy, Moody was alone in his room, occupied in writing to Isabel. Being unwilling that any eyes but his own should see the address, he had himself posted his letter. The time that he had chosen for leaving the house proving, unfortunately, to be also the time proposed by her ladyship for his interview with the lawyer. In ten minutes after the footman had reported his absence, Moody returned. It was then too late to present himself in the drawing-room. In the interval, Mr. Troy had taken his leave, and Moody's position had dropped a degree lower in Lady Lydiard's estimation. Isabel received her letter by the next morning's post. If any justification of Mr. Troy's suspicions had been needed, the terms in which Moody wrote would have amply supplied it. Dear Isabel, I hope I may call you Isabel without offending you in your present trouble. I have a proposal to make, which, whether you accept it or not, I beg you will keep a secret from every living creature but ourselves. You will understand my request when I add that these lines relate to the matter of tracing the stolen banknote. I have been privately in communication with a person in London who is, as I believe, the one person competent to help us in gaining our end. He has already made many inquiries in private. With some of them I am acquainted. The rest he has thus far kept to himself. The person to whom I allude particularly wishes to have a half an hour's conversation with you in my presence. I am bound to warn you that he is a very strange and very ugly old man, and I can only hope that you will look over his personal appearance in consideration of what he is likely to do for your future advantage. Can you conveniently meet us at the farther end of the row of villas in which your aunt lives the day after tomorrow at four o'clock? Let me have a line to say if you will keep the appointment and if the hour named will suit you. And believe me, your devoted friend and servant, Robert Moody. The lawyer's warning to her to be careful how she yielded too readily to any proposal of Moody's recurred to Isabel's mind while she read those lines. Being pledged to secrecy, she could not consult Mr. Troy she was left to decide for herself. No obstacle stood in the way of her free choice of alternatives. After their early dinner at three o'clock, Miss Pink habitually retired to her own room to meditate, as she expressed it. Her meditations inevitably ended in a sound sleep of some hours, and during that interval Isabel was at liberty to do as she pleased. After considerable hesitation, 
her implicit belief in Moody's truth and devotion, assisted by a strong feeling of curiosity to see the companion with whom the steward had associated himself, decided Isabel on consenting to keep the appointment. Taking up her position beyond the houses, on the day and at the hour mentioned by Moody, she believed herself to be fully prepared for the most unfavorable impression which the most disagreeable of all possible strangers could produce. But the first appearance of old Sharon, as dirty as ever, clothed in a long, frowsy, gray overcoat, with his pug dog at his heels, and his smoke-blackened pipe in his mouth, with a tan white hat on his head, which looked as if it had been picked up in a gutter, a hideous leer in his eyes, and a jaunty trip in his walk, took her so completely by surprise that she could only return Moody's friendly greeting by silently pressing his hand. As for Moody's companion, to look at him for a second time was more than she had resolution to do. She kept her eyes fixed on the pug-dog, and with good reason. As far as appearances went, he was indisputably the nobler animal of the two. Under the circumstances, the interview threatened to begin in a very embarrassing manner. Moody, disheartened by Isabel's silence, made no attempt to set the conversation going. He looked as if he meditated a hasty retreat to the railway station which he had just left. Fortunately, he had at his side the right man, for once, in the right place. Old Sharon's effrontery was equal to any emergency. "'I am not a nice-looking old man, my dear, am I?' he said, leering at Isabel with cunning, half-closed eyes. "'Bless your heart! You'll soon get used to me. You see, I am the sort of color, as they say at the linen drapers, that doesn't wash well. It's all through love. Upon my life it is. Early in the present century I had my young affections blighted, and I've neglected myself ever since.' Disappointment takes different forms, miss, in different men. I don't think I have had hard enough to brush my hair for the last fifty years. She was a magnificent woman, Mr. Moody, and she dropped me like a hot potato. Dreadful! Dreadful! Let us pursue this painful subject no further. Ha! Here's a pretty country. Here's a nice blue sky. I admire the country, miss. I see so little of it, you know. Have you any objection to walk along into the fields? The fields, my dear, bring out all the poetry of my nature. Where's the dog? Here, Puggy. Puggy. Hunt about, my man, and find some dog grass. Does his inside good, you know, after a meat diet in London. Lord, how I feel my spirits rising in this fine air. Does my complexion look any brighter, miss? Will you run a race with me, Mr. Moody, or will you oblige me with a back at Leapfrog? I'm not mad, my dear young lady. I'm only merry. I live, you see, in the London stink, and the smell of the hedges and the wild flowers is too much for me at first. It gets into my head, it does. I'm drunk. As I live by bread, I'm drunk on fresh air. Oh, what a jolly day! Oh, how young and innocent I do feel! Here his innocence got the better of him, and he began to sing, I wish I were a little fly in my love's bosom for to lie. Hello, here we are on the nice soft grass, and oh, my gracious, there's a bank running down into a hollow. I can't stand that, you know, Mr. Moody, hold my hat, and take the greatest care of it. Here goes for a roll down the bank. He handed his horrible hat to the astonished Moody, laid himself flat on the top of the bank, and deliberately rolled down it, exactly as he might have done when he was a boy. The tails of his long gray coat flew madly in the wind. The dog pursued him, jumping over him, and barking with delight. He shouted and screamed in answer to the dog as he rolled over and over, faster and faster, and when he got up on the level ground 
and called out cheerfully to his companions standing above him, I say, you two, I feel twenty years younger already. Human gravity could hold out no longer. The sad and silent Moody smiled, and Isabel burst into fits of laughter. There, he said, didn't I tell you you would get used to me, miss? There's a deal of life left in the old man yet, isn't there? Shy me down my hat, Mr. Moody, and now we'll get to business. He turned round to the dog still barking at his heels. Business, Puggy, he called out sharply, and Puggy instantly shut up his mouth and said no more. Well, now, old Sharon resumed, when he had joined his friends and had got his breath again, let's have a little talk about yourself, miss. Has Mr. Moody told you who I am and what I want with you? Very good. May I offer you my arm? No, you like to be independent, don't you? All right, I don't object. I am an amiable old man, I am. About this Lady Lydiard now, suppose you tell me how you first got acquainted with her. In some surprise at this question, Isabel told her little story. Observing Sharon's face while she was speaking, Moody saw that he was not paying the smallest attention to the narrative. His sharp, shameless black eyes watched the girl's face absently. His gross lips curled upwards in a sardonic and self-satisfied smile. He was evidently setting a trap for her of some kind. Without a word of warning, while Isabel was in the middle of a sentence, the trap opened with the opening of old Sharon's lips. I say, he burst out, how came you to seal her ladyship's letter, eh? The question bore no sort of relation, direct or indirect, to what Isabel happened to be saying at the moment. In the sudden surprise of hearing it, she started and fixed her eyes in astonishment on Sharon's face. The old vagabond chuckled to himself. Did you see that? he whispered to Moody. I beg your pardon, miss, he went on. I won't interrupt you again. Lord, how interesting it is. Ain't it, Mr. Moody? Please to go on, miss. But Isabel, though she spoke with perfect sweetness and temper, declined to go on. I had better tell you, sir, how I came to seal her ladyship's letter, she said. If I may venture on giving my opinion, that part of my story seems to be the only part of it which relates to your business with me today. Without further preface, she described the circumstances which had led to her assuming the perilous responsibility of sealing the letter. Old Sharon's wandering attention began to wander again. He was evidently occupied in setting another trap. For the second time, he interrupted Isabel in the middle of a sentence. Suddenly stopping short, he pointed to some sheep at the further end of the field through which they happened to be passing at the moment. There's a pretty sight, he said. There are the innocent sheep of feeding, all following each other as usual. And there's the sly dog waiting behind the gate till the sheep wants his services. Reminds me of old Sharon and the public. He chuckled over the discovery of the remarkable similarity between the sheep dog and himself, and the sheep and the public, and then burst upon Isabel with a second question. I say, didn't you look at the letter before you sealed it? Certainly not, Isabel answered. Not even at the address? No. Thinking of something else, eh? Very likely, said Isabel. Was it your new bonnet, my dear? Isabel laughed. Women are not always thinking of their new bonnets, she answered. Old Sharon, to all appearance, dropped the subject there. He lifted his lean brown forefinger and pointed again this time to a house at a short distance from them. "'That's a farmhouse, surely,' he said. "'I'm thirsty after my roll down the hill. Do you think, miss, that they would give me a drink of milk?' "'I am sure they would,' said Isabel. "'I know the people. Shall I go and ask them?' "'Thank you, my dear. One word more before you go. About the sealing of that letter. What could you have been thinking of while you were doing it?' He looked hard at her and took her suddenly by the arm. Was it your sweetheart? he asked in a whisper. The question instantly reminded Isabel 
that she had been thinking of Hardyman while she sealed the letter. She blushed as the remembrance crossed her mind. Robert, noticing the embarrassment, spoke sharply to old Sharon. "'You have no right to put such a question to a young lady,' he said. "'Be a little more careful for the future.' "'There, there, don't be hard on me,' pleaded the old rogue. "'An ugly old man like me may make his innocent little joke, eh, miss? "'I'm sure you're too sweet-tempered to be angry when I meant no offence. "'Show me that you bear no malice. "'Go like a forgiving young angel and ask for the milk.' nobody appealed to isabel's sweetness of temper in vain i will do it with pleasure she said and hastened away to the farmhouse end of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen of my lady's money this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org Recording by Dion Johns, Salt Lake City, Utah. My Lady's Money by Wilkie Collins. Chapter 14. The instant Isabel was out of hearing, old Sharon slapped Moody on the shoulder to rouse his attention. I've got her out of the way, he said. Now listen to me. My business with the young angel is done. I may go back to London. Moody looked at him with astonishment. Lord, how little you know of thieves exclaimed old sharon why man alive i have tried her with two plain tests if you wanted a proof of her innocence there it was as plain as the nose in your face did you hear me ask her how she came to seal the letter just when her mind was running on something else i heard you said moody did you see how she started and stared at me i did well, I can tell you this, if she had stolen the money, she would neither have started nor stared. She would have had her answer ready beforehand in her own mind, in case of accidents. There's only one thing in my experience that you can never do with a thief. When a thief happens to be a woman, you can never take her by surprise. Put that remark by in your mind. One day you may find a use for remembering it. Did you see her blush, and look quite hurt in her feelings, pretty dear, when I asked her about her sweetheart? Do you think a thief in her place would have shown such a face as that? Not she. The thief would have been relieved. The thief would have said to herself, All right, the more the old fool talks about sweethearts, the further he is from tracing the robbery to me. Yes, yes. The ground's cleared now, Master Moody. I've reckoned up the servants. I've questioned Miss Isabel. I've made my inquiries in all the other quarters that may be useful to us. And what's the result? The advice I gave when you and the lawyer first came to me, I hate that fellow, remains as sound and good advice as ever. I have got the thief in my mind, said old Sharon, closing his cunning eyes and then opening them again as plain as i've got you in my eye at this minute no more of that now he went on looking round sharply at the path that led to the farmhouse i've something particular to say to you and there's barely time to say it before that nice girl comes back look here do you happen to be acquainted with mr honorable hardyman's valet moody's eyes rested on old sharon with a searching and doubtful look Mr. Hardyman's valet, he repeated. I wasn't prepared to hear Mr. Hardyman's name. Old Sharon looked at Moody in his turn with a flash of sardonic triumph. Aho, he said, has my good boy learned his lesson? Do you see the thief through my spectacles already? I began to see him, Moody answered, when you gave us the guinea opinion at your lodgings. Will you whisper his name? asked Old Sharon. Not yet. I distrust my own judgment. I wait till time proves that you are right. Old Sharon knitted his shaggy brows and shook his head. If you had only a little more dash and go in you, he said, you would be a clever fellow. As it is, 
he finished the sentence by snapping his fingers with a grin of contempt let's get to business are you going back by the next train along with me or are you going to stop with the young lady i will follow you by a later train moody answered then i must give you my instructions at once sharon continued you get better acquainted with hardyman's valet lend him money if he wants it stick at nothing to make a bosom friend of him i can't do that part of it my appearance would be against me you are the man you are respectable from the top of your hat to the tips of your boots nobody would suspect you don't make objections can you fix the valet or can't you i can try said moody and what then old sharon put his gross lips disagreeably close to moody's ear your friend the valet can tell you who his master's bankers are he said and he can supply you with a specimen of his master's handwriting moody drew back as suddenly as if his vagabond companion had put a knife to his throat you old villain he said are you tempting me to forgery you infernal fool retorted old sharon will you hold that long tongue of yours and hear what i have to say you go to hardyman's bankers with a note in hardyman's handwriting exactly imitated by me to this effect mr h presents his compliments to messrs so-and-so and is not quite certain whether a payment of five hundred pounds has been made within the last week to his account he will be much obliged if messrs so-and-so will inform him by a line in reply whether there is such an entry to his credit in their books and by whom the payment has been made you wait for the banker's answer and bring it to me it's just possible that the name you're afraid to whisper may appear in the letter if it does we've caught our man is that forgery mr muddlehead moody i'll tell you what if i had lived to be your age and knew no more of the world than you do i'd go and hang myself steady here's our charming friend with the milk remember your instructions and don't lose heart if my notion of the payment to the bankers comes to nothing i know what to do next in that case and what's more i'll take all the risk and trouble on my own shoulders oh lord i'm afraid i shall be obliged to drink the milk now it's come with this apprehension in his mind he advanced to relieve isabel of the jug that she carried here's a treat he burst out with an affectation of joy which was completely belied by the expression of his dirty face here's a kind and dear young lady to help an old man to a drink with her own pretty hands he paused and looked at the milk very much as he might have looked at a dose of physic will anyone take a drink first he asked offering the jug piteously to isabel and moody you see i'm not wed to genuine milk i'm used to chalk and water i don't know what effect the unadulterated cow might have on my poor old inside he tasted the milk with the greatest caution upon my soul this is too rich for me the unadulterated cow is a deal too strong to be drunk alone if you'll allow me i'll qualify it with a drop of gin here puggy puggy he set the milk down before the dog and taking a flask out of his pocket emptied it at a draught that's something like he said smacking his lips with an air of infinite relief so sorry miss to have given you all your trouble for nothing it's my ignorance that's to blame not me i couldn't know i was unworthy of genuine milk till i tried could i and do you know he proceeded with his eyes directed slyly on the way back to the station i begin to think i'm not worthy of the fresh air either a kind of longing seems to come over me for the london stink i'm homesick already for the soot of my happy childhood and my own dear native mud the air here is too thin for me and the sky's too clean and oh lord when you're wed to the roar of the traffic the buses and the cabs and what not the silence in these parts is downright awful 
I'll wish you good evening, miss, and get back to London. Isabel turned to Moody with disappointment plainly expressed in her face and manner. Is that all he has to say? she asked. You told me he could help us. You led me to suppose he could find the guilty person. Sharon heard her. I could name the guilty person, he answered, as easily, miss, as I could name you. Why don't you do it then? Isabel inquired, not very patiently. Because the time's not right for it yet, miss. That's one reason. Because if I mentioned the thief's name as things are now, you, Miss Isabel, would think me mad and you would tell Mr. Moody I had cheated him out of his money. That's another reason. The matter's in train, if you will only wait a little longer. So you say, Isabel rejoined, if you really could name the thief, I believe you would do it now. She turned away with a frown on her pretty face. Old Sharon followed her. Even his coarse sensibilities appeared to feel the irresistible ascendancy of beauty and youth. I say, he began, we must part friends, you know, or I shall break my heart over it. They have got milk at the farmhouse. Do you think they have got pen, ink, and paper, too? Isabel answered without turning to look at him. Of course they have. And a bit of sealing wax? I dare say. Old Sharon laid his dirty claws on her shoulder and forced her to face him as the best means of shaking them off. "'Come along,' he said. "'I am going to pacify you with some information in writing.' "'Why should you write it?' Isabel asked suspiciously. "'Because I mean to make my own conditions, my dear, before I let you into the secret.' In ten minutes more they were all three in the farmhouse parlor. Nobody but the farmer's wife was at home. The good woman trembled from head to foot, at the side of old Sharon. In all her harmless life she had never yet seen humanity under the aspect in which it was now presented to her. "'Mercy preserve us, miss,' she whispered to Isabel. "'How come you to be in such company as that?' Instructed by Isabel, she produced the necessary materials for writing and sealing, and, that done, she shrank away to the door." "'Please to excuse me, miss,' she said, with a last horrified look at her venerable visitor. "'I really can't stand the sight of such a blot of dirt as that in my nice clean parlor.' With those words she disappeared, and was seen no more. Perfectly indifferent to his reception, old Sharon wrote, enclosed what he had written in an envelope, and sealed it, in the absence of anything better fitted for his purpose with the mouthpiece of his pipe. Now, miss, he said, you give me your word of honor. He stopped and looked round at Moody with a grin. And you give me yours, that you won't either of you break the seal on this envelope till the expiration of one week from the present day. There are the conditions, Miss Isabel, on which I'll give you your information. If you stop to dispute with me, the candle's alight, and I'll burn it. It was useless to contend with him. Isabel and Moody gave him the promise that he required. He handed the sealed envelope to Isabel with a low bow. When the week's out, he said, you will own I'm a cleverer fellow than you think me now. Wish you good evening, miss. Come along, Puggy. Farewell to the horrid, clean country, and back again to the nice London stink. He nodded to Moody. He leered at Isabel. He chuckled to himself. He left the farmhouse. End of chapter 14